Hi everyone, thanks for checking out this video. It's already December of 2021, and it's really hard to imagine that we have been in this COVID pandemic for almost two years now. And now a new variant, Omicron, is raging across the world again. What's even more difficult to fathom for many finance professionals is that the stock market has been on a relentless bull run continuing the long bullish market since the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. Despite the over 30% collapse when COVID became a pandemic in March 2020. At this point, you're probably hearing a lot of talks about rotation from growth stocks to value stocks and how growth stocks have been the beneficiary from the extreme quantitative easing from the Fed and other central banks um, around the world during the pandemic. In this video, uh, we are going to take a look at the so-called value versus growth stock categorization. Value versus growth investing is obviously a very big topic. And the ultimate goal of any investment is, of course, to generate good positive returns over time. We won't be so ambitious here to cover everything. And we also would like to emphasize that we are not providing financial advice here because investing and trading come with enormous risk. So this is for educational purposes only. In this video, we will discuss some basic concepts based on common definition. What is a value stock? What is a growth stock? And how they have performed with respect to each other in the recent past. And by common definition, what does it really mean? And do people actually agree? Hopefully, it will clear some of the common misconceptions and you will get some fresh perspective that you usually don't get it somewhere else. And as always in this channel, we will try to describe things in a more quantitative and objective manner, but less of a hand-waving approach. You may be surprised that some of the most famous investors, unlike most of the Wall Street, don't really think about stocks as value or growth. And Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are some of them. We will get to this at the end of the video. One of the best ways to get some intuitive understanding is to just look at some examples. Here, we are looking at two classic examples. The green line is the stock price history before the pandemic of Netflix, considered one of the biggest growth stories in the last decade. The orange line is the recent stock price history in the same period of JP Morgan, one of the largest financial institutions in the US and the world. It's categorized as a value stock by most people. At the first glance, just based on these two examples, we can see at least in the period shown here, the growth stock has grown substantially more than the value stock, but with a higher volatility, assuming you are using the same leverage. The value stock has experienced a more timid growth, but it also exhibits lower uncertainties. In fact, we just touched upon some of the basic features of potential price moves of value and growth stocks. A growth stock is usually expected to have a potential for higher returns, but with higher uncertainty. Now let's take a look at the definition of value stock on uh, Investopedia. A value stock refers to the stock of a company that appears to trade at a lower price relative to its fundamentals. By lower, it means the stock is currently undervalued with respect to its intrinsic value derived from the fundamental economics. Some common characteristics include high dividend yield, low price to book PP ratio, low price to earnings PE ratio. To put this into some context, a value stock is undervalued compared to model expectations derived from fundamentals. 
since the intrinsic value is expected to be higher, if you go long on the stock, technically, you expect the value will mean revert to its higher fair value. And psychologically, that's a contrarian view. Since the current trend relative to the intrinsic value is bearish. While as far as the risk appetite is concerned, you expect more steady returns with lower volatility, as opposed to a growth stock, for example. If you are familiar with a capital asset pricing model, CAPM, that means it's beta. It's smaller than that of a more a volatile stock. Now, what about a growth stock? A growth stock refers to the stock of a company that is anticipated to grow at a rate significantly above the average growth for the market. Obviously, uh, expected significant growth is the most important aspect of the definition. Usually, growth stocks often look expensive, trading at a high price to earnings P ratio. But such valuation could actually be cheap if the company continues to grow rapidly, which will drive the share price up. This means even though the price appears to be expensive, if we model it by accounting for the growth, it's actually cheap. And that's why you want to stay um, or go long on this stock. However, if this anticipated growth did not happen, the stock can see dramatic declines, and you may experience a significant loss, but not growth, of your invested capital. Now, put this into the same broad context as for value stocks as before. A growth stock has a higher potential of significant future growth. Usually, it's already expensive, so technically, you expect it to be trending with upward momentum. Psychologically, if you go long on such a stock that has not shown strong fundamentals in the past yet, but already has a high price, you are probably part of the formal group or a herd. In terms of risk appetite, you may worry that the stock may undergo some large swings with significant downside. But you may be okay with paying that risk premium for potentially higher reward. In the language of CAPM, its beta is expected to be higher than that of a typical value stock. Does that mean a value stock is a safe bet, since it's supposed to be cheap, at least based on the model? Think about any technical mean reversion strategy based on a contrarian view. If the reason the stock price is under the supposedly higher intrinsic value is that there's something fundamentally wrong with the company, but the model simply missed it. Say there's some error in the accounting or some exogenous uh, factors at a play. The downward trend may continue and the price may never mean revert. In that case, you're stuck with a potentially really, really bad stock or you're stuck in your value trap. On the other hand, you may jump on a formal bandwagon, go long a growth stock, but the growth potential may not even be realized, at least not in the same time frame as you originally expected. And the stock turned out to be completely overpriced. Then you would lose most of the capital you put in due to the significant downside slide. But does that mean value and growth are really complementary to each other? They are still part of the broader economy, and the relative performance, our performance or underperformance, is usually considered excess returns with respect to a certain benchmark, say SPX, the large cap index. To take a more objective view, let's take a look at the historical comparison of uh, value stocks and growth stocks and compare them against SPX. 
we will use BlackRock's iShares Value ETF, IVE, as an example of a basket of value stocks within the large cap SP500. And their growth ETF, IVW, as an example of a basket of growth stocks, also within the large cap index. We do need to bear in mind that these are large companies, usually with more mature economics. So their characteristics are not exactly the same as mid cap or small cap companies. Also, it needs to be emphasized that these ETFs are rebalanced annually. So the actual stocks within the basket are updated every year, and the selection is based on the rules defined by the ETF providers. So there are a particular realization of growth and the value definitions, and other people may have different definitions. Starting with the most recent history since the collapse in March 2020, when COVID-19 became a pandemic. We see the large cap growth has outperformed SPX, and both of them have outperformed the large cap value. Let's zoom out slightly to the start of 2020. Despite the over 30% downturn in March, all the indices have generated significant returns, with the growth having generated over 60% in the last two years. That's really a stellar return. Um, any way you look at it. Zooming out one year at a time to the start of 2019 for the last three years, then 2018 for the last four years, then 2017 for the last five years. And finally, 2016 for the last six years. We see over the last six years, the stock market has had an unbelievable bullish run, with growth stocks outperform value stocks by almost 100%. Does that mean growth stocks are always a better performer than value stocks, at least in a bull market? or an expansionary phase of a business cycle. Let's look at the period right after 2008 crisis. All large cap stocks have performed well, and the growth and the value, in fact, have pretty similar returns up until 2015. What about the period right before, during, and right after the 2008 crisis. This may be a little counterintuitive to some of us. It turns out the growth stocks actually outperformed value stocks between 2007 and 2011. In fact, value stocks, at least those in iShares IVE back in that period, had a negative 20% return compared to IVW the growth stocks, which got back to the positive territory by 2011 already. Seems like growth stocks have always been a better bet, but uh, it's not really always true. Let's look at the first half of the first decade in the 21st century. After the tech bubble burst, we see in this period Value stocks have outperformed growth stocks. Until before the subprime mortgage crisis, the value stocks outperformed growth by almost 50%, with the latter still underwater. To briefly summarize, since 2015, the growth stocks have outperformed SPX in the value. After the subprime mortgage crisis until 2015, both growth and value stocks generated similar good returns. While in the period from before and right after the crisis, growth again outperformed value stocks. 
The exception happened after the tech bubble burst, when value stocks outperformed growth significantly. I register with those defined in these two ETFs, IVE and IVW. We have kept saying we are looking at the two ETFs that have their specific definitions of value and growth. Not everyone agrees on the definition, of course. Next, we're going to see what Warren Buffett thinks about this value versus growth categorization. Warren Buffett is considered one of the best value investors. He learned about value investing from pioneers like Benjamin Graham and Philip Fisher. There's a link in the description showing a video clip of his view on value versus growth during one of Berkshire Hathaway's annual meetings. You may be surprised to learn that he and his partner Charlie Munger consider that value and growth stocks are indistinguishable. There's no difference between them. To be more specific, they consider growth as part of the value equation. He says, if you tell me that you own a business that's going to grow to the sky, and isn't that wonderful? I don't know if that's wonderful or not until I know what the economics are of that growth. He goes on to say, anyone that tells you that you should put your money in growth stocks or value stocks does not understand investing. He even says it makes him cringe when he hears people talk about value versus growth. If you look at how iShares categorize value and growth stocks, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway is considered a value stock in IVE. While within their holdings, Apple, their largest holding, is considered a growth stock in IVW, as well as some other holdings, Amazon, Johnson & Johnson, etc. Of course, just because Warren Buffett is one of the most successful investors of all time, it doesn't mean everything he says is absolute truth. The main difference between his view and the common Wall Street view is really in what he means by value. We can make some simple assumptions and say, let's use projected future cash flows to estimate a company's intrinsic value and explain what this difference essentially means. If we estimate the intrinsic value of a company as the sum of projected cash flows in the future, discounted to the present, we will need a model to project the future cash flows and then sum up those projected cash flows, discounted to the present. If we believe this value is higher than current stock price, we say the stock is undervalued and it's a value stock. But this can work for so-called growth stocks too. If you use a conservative model to project future cash flows, you may get a low intrinsic value, and you may conclude that the stock is too expensive if it's higher than that value. However, if you account for the potentially high growth in your model, you may get a higher intrinsic value, and the stock, which may appear very expensive at a first glance, can in fact be considered very cheap. And to some investors, like Warren Buffett, it has no difference with a value stock if you model the value correctly, because growth, in this case, is part of the value equation. Nevertheless, it's probably about technicality, because you can consider that in Warren Buffett's view, value stocks include both value and growth stocks, while in the conventional Wall Street view, you simply separate them at a more granular level, based on whether or not you expect the growth to be substantially higher than others. Further, to some people, value stocks are not necessarily undervalued. They could be just mature companies with very good economics and it would continue to do very well. While to others, value stocks could mean stocks that have been hammered so bad that their stock price is even lower than their asset value, a so-called 
cigar butt stock. Another point often made about a value and growth stocks is that they share considerable overlap with sector categorization and or cyclical and non-cyclical classification. Again, using iShares ETFs as an example, we see value stocks tend to be financials, healthcare, industrials, consumer staples, but also can be mature technology companies or even consumer discretionary. While growth stocks usually are innovative technology companies and are consumer discretionary, but they also include companies in non cyclical sectors that may be growing really fast. We have used large cap stocks as an example. One can, of course, divide smaller companies into value and growth stocks as well. If you are interested in investing in ETFs, you probably want to invest in Vanguard ETFs instead of others because their expense ratios are usually lower than others. They also pride themselves in making everything very simple. If you search for Vanguard style box, you can find their matrix in the market cap by value growth dimension. Zooming in on a given row for a given cap, they have funds ranging from value to blend and to growth. While if we zoom in on a given column, they have large cap, mid cap, and a small cap for a given class. The ultimate goal of investing is to hopefully get more money back for what you put in now. But the timing in the market is very difficult. If you are a very long-term investor, if not a long-term investor, is it really worth the effort to rotate between stocks with different characteristics? It's a question even most professionals struggle to answer. But hopefully this video is at least useful to help you form your own thoughts. Finally, it may be fun but also helpful to try to categorize athletes as a value or growth stocks. If you think about LeBron James in his high school years, rookie years, years when he made consecutive finals, and now, which category would you put him in different years? What about Steph Curry in his college years, in his rookie years, during Warrior Dynasty years, and now, again, which category would you put him in different years? You may want to think it over if you warn yourself not to have any hindsight bias. Okay, again, value versus growth is a very big topic in finance. This short video is by no means designed to cover everything or even anything in depth. But hopefully you will find it useful. Okay, thanks for watching and hope to see you again next time.